your house and house rules. If you have one of these, please turn it off or put it on silent in respect for our speaker. Number two, we have evaluation forms. Please fill these out for our speakers and also to collect a raffle ticket and a poker chip. That way you can win the raffle. And so I would like to introduce our speaker, Lane Rodder. Lane Rodder put his communication skills to test by entering a competition in 2005, which earned him the title, America's Greatest Thinker. Winning the Think the Great American Think Off took every communication skill he learned in Toastmasters and more, which he's going to share with you at this conference today. So please put your hands together for Blaine Rodder. Wait till the end. You're not sure yet if it's worth applauding. <laughs> I know what this is like when you're at a conference and there's breakout sessions and you're challenged to know which one am I supposed to go to. All of them look good. So here's what I have as a little piece of advice. If five or ten minutes into this session, this is not what you came here for, not your cup of tea, trust me, it does not insult me if you just get up and move on and find one that's more suitable, okay? Now, if everybody gets up and goes, we'll just call that a break. <laughs> So I had a really unique experience back in 2005. I entered an event called the Great American Think Off, and I'm going to be walking you through that journey, partly because of the communication skills, many of which I learned in Toastmasters, that I had to use in order to be able to ultimately win the event and get the title America's Greatest Thinker. I'm also going to walk you through the process because I'm actually going to encourage each one of you if you have any interest in this event, okay, just like me there, any interest in that event to participate. So let me start with their website. This is the website to the Great American Think Off, www.thinkoff.org. Thinkoff.org. Highly encourage you to check it out. Okay, so if you have a handout, and I think just about everybody in here probably does. What's pictured on the front? Coins, two dimes. What would be another way of saying two if you were playing cards? Pair. So what we have here is a paradigm. My belief is that when we speak, the reason we speak is to affect and change paradigms. And it took, as I said, every Toastmaster communication skill I've learned and more to be able to affect an audience to side with my paradigm to ultimately win this event. So it wasn't just about speaking, it was about thinking, writing, listening, debating, and of course, speaking. Okay, so here we go. Go ahead and open up your handout to the communi communication trifecta. Three things that I think are incredibly important when you are trying to influence paradigms. And we're going to drill down into each of these in more detail. And I'll just give you an overview for right now. Your expertise, your eloquence, and your engagement. Now, the question that I had to answer in 2005 was what you see at the top of the page there. Which benefits society more, competition or cooperation? Every year, the Think Off poses a question like that. January, the beginning of January, they put out the question for that year. They invite people to submit an essay that responds to that question. So the very first thing you have to do when you see or hear what their question is, is figure out if you have an opinion about that, and start to figure out which side of the fence are you on, because all of the questions require that you be on one side or the other. So competition or cooperation? What benefits society more? Competition, cooperation. I don't know about you, but the more I thought about it, the more confused I got. <laughs> because you have kind of this initial impression, oh, I think it's this. And then you start kind of thinking it through and you ask other people, hey, what do you think about this question? And, and all of a sudden it's, no, 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 I think now I'm going to be over here on the other side. 
And then you kind of think through that and you start thinking about your life experiences. Oh, well, no, no, maybe I'm back over here where I started. Most of the questions will have that kind of a response in you. So I'll get to what side did I pick as we go through the, go through the day. So expertise, here's just a couple of things before we drill down deeper. Your expertise is having something worthwhile to say. Have something worthwhile to say. That is the expertise component of communication. Critical that it be worthwhile. Why? Because there's no shortage of people who have plenty to say. <laughs> right? You just turn on the radio, you flick on the television, and there's all kinds of folks that are just spouting their opinions out at you. And I would have to think that a lot of that is frankly not that worthwhile. So make sure what it is that you speak about that relates to your expertise provides something that's worthwhile to say. This is what I call doing your homework. It's doing the homework before you show up to speak or before you open up your mouth. And what that required in this event was writing an essay. So I had to pick a side, and then I had to write an essay, 750 words or less. Now for those of you that have dabbled in writing, 750 words is not a lot, it's a few minutes if you read it. So how do you make a compelling case in 750 words that not only says this is what I believe, but this is why, this is what backs it up, these are my experiences. That in itself is a challenge that I continue to do every year. I've entered the Think Off almost every year since I won. I was only selected as a finalist the first year I entered. I still continue to write an essay every year that the question means something to me. Now, for instance, this year's question was, does poetry matter? I don't care, frankly. <laughs> well, it doesn't. I'm just not into poetry. I've never understood it. I don't understand it when I read it. So I would have no ability to articulate does poetry matter. So I, I did not submit an essay this year, but almost every year the question is something I have an opinion about, and just the exercise of crafting a 750-word essay that clearly expresses your opinion, that is a very worthwhile skill. It doesn't matter if you want to become a writer, it helps you become more articulate and a better speaker. So, I wrote my essay, what they ultimately do, out of the hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many they get, they select four. They pick two people that chose competition, they pick two people that chose cooperation, and they bring them into this little small town in northern Minnesota, New York Mills. One of the finalists misread it, thought it was a trip to New York. <laughs> this is a little town I had to fly into Fargo, rent a car, drive over into northern Minnesota. This is the last place on the earth you would think in an event of this magnitude, where sometimes C-SPAN is there, you know, taping this, filming it, New York Mills. It's kind of this artistic place in the middle of a rural community that's got this state-of-the-art auditorium that hosts this annual think-off. So they bring the four finalists in, they pay your expenses, you get $500 as just part of being a finalist, and you're going to engage in a debate. And ultimately this audience of several hundred people from around the whole area is going to decide who is America's greatest thinker for that year. All right, so that was expertise. Next, eloquence. Say it well. This is what we focus on so much in Toastmasters, right? Saying it well. Those skills that make it seem effortless, that make you easy to listen to. This is your expression. Now, the way this panned out for me was that in the first round, I had to debate the other person that chose the same side I chose. Well, that's an interesting way to have a discussion. Because the audience needed to pick which of the two of us makes the most compelling case for that side. So I had to debate the person that basically thought the same thing I did. And the other two people that had the same or the other side of the question, they had to debate each other. And then the audience would pick which ones are then going to go head to head in the final debate. Well, the final debate takes us to engagement. Engagement is involved the audience. And I'll tell you more about this as we drill down a little deeper. But as speakers, it's not just about having something worthwhile to say. And it's not just about saying it well. It's about involving the audience. This was round two of the debate. And obviously being focused on the audience for me was very important because the audience decides who wins. And their task is, don't vote for who you agree with. Vote for who makes the most compelling case. 
That was their charge. Don't necessarily vote for who thinks like you, but vote for who made their case in the most compelling way. Okay, so let's drill that a little deeper into all three of those. Next page, expertise. I've got a couple of different areas here, developing expertise and communicating expertise. And I hope you're okay with this kind of rapid fire approach. We have very little time here and I want to give you as much content as I possibly can. So, developing expertise requires listening. Now, a lot of folks would say, well, Blaine, doesn't expertise mean your experience? Doesn't it mean your background? All the stuff that you've known and done for all these years? Yeah, absolutely. That's part of your expertise. But I've learned that there's a shortcut to getting expertise, and that's using other people's expertise. <laughs> right? O-P-E. Other, you know, you hear these philosophies about using other people's money, right, to achieve certain financial goals. Well, how about using other people's experience? Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting we steal ideas, we just parrot what we heard on the radio this morning. I'm saying if you really truly listen to one another, your level of expertise in that topic area soars because you're not just all about what you think about it, you're what other thing people think about it. So before I even came to a conclusion of what side am I on here, competition, cooperation, I was asking all kinds of people that question. What do you think, right? And it didn't matter if I was kind of leaning towards their side or not. I'm gathering expertise from anybody that would help me in trying to figure out for myself what do I really believe about this question. Is it competition or is it cooperation that best is best for society? Okay, so a couple of other suggestions here for developing expertise. Diversity of thought means surround yourself with people who don't think like you. We tend to do the opposite. We tend to engage most with the people that think like we think because that's comfortable. It's uncomfortable. Think about touchy subjects, politics, religion. It's difficult to talk to people who philosophically see the world so differently than you do, right? Some of you have family members that you know when you get together at Thanksgiving. There's certain things we just don't talk about anymore, right? That's so sad because the only way we understand the other side is to actually engage in that process of listening and surrounding ourselves with people whose views aren't like ours. In fact, I think it was Stanford University that did a study. They took people who identified themselves as being conservative and they put them all together. Then they took a group of people who identified themselves as being liberal, they put them all together. They waited to see what would happen after these groups spent a lot of time with each other. You probably understand what's going to happen. Each group became more radical and extreme in its view because that's all they were surrounded with was their same like opinions. So as hard as it is to listen to the other side, I'm encouraging you to do that. It makes you a better communicator. And thinking like a preschooler, if you can remember what it was like to be four, or if you've ever had a four-year-old in your presence, what's an incessant question that they ask so much you want to wring their little neck? Why? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, we tend to squash that out of young people at a very early age, because it's frustrating as an adult that you answer the question, which is followed by why, and then you answer the question, which is followed by why, and finally you're so exasperated, you just say something like, because I said so, right? <laughs> like that response, but they're the little kid. They can't do much about that. Now, we get into the workplace, or even before that, you get into school, people start asking why. Teachers say, just listen to what I have to say. You're disrupting the class. Stop asking why. You get into the workplace, and you start saying, why do we do things around here like this? People say things like, shh, shh, we've always done it this way. Just, just do your job, right? Don't stir things up. I'm suggesting you be the preschooler. Now, don't get yourself in trouble, right? Don't be a nuisance, but why is an outstanding question, and you do actually have to ask it several times to get the layers down to what really counts. So the kids have actually got it. The kids actually understand that you have to ask why several times to get to what I call the truth of something. Okay, communicating expertise begins with thinking. And I'm not talking about the thinking on your feet. It was eloquently demonstrated last night, and we practiced in Toastmasters. But obviously, to have something worthwhile to say, it starts with the thoughts that we have in our head. So here's a few suggestions for you. I looked at competition and cooperation, and I said, well, if we put that together, because isn't everything really a blend anyway, we get cooperation. <laughs> and I actually used that word in the debate. I said, you know what I think we're really talking about here is not two ends of, of spectrum, 
but something that really is kind of a blending of both, which is a word that I just kind of put the two words together and competition came out. But here's the point of that. I don't think you can effectively argue one side of a question without being able to argue the other. I don't think you can effectively argue one side of a question or a philosophy or a belief without also being able to effectively argue the other side. And again, when you hear yourself about to say, but, or, you know, someone sharing something with you, an idea, now you have a little bit of a, of a different idea, and so you're listening, you're listening, and when they're done you say, yes, but, yes, or, and the moment you say, but, or, or, what have you just done? You completely discounted everything that the person said, right? In their mind, you may not have meant that, but that's what that word implies. So I would suggest you use the word and. That's an interesting idea. And this is what I believe. I mean, this is great for parenting. This is great for the workplace. This not using but and or, but using instead and. Because really everything is and. All right, not just what, but why. Everybody has a what, this is what I believe, this is what my philosophy is. Make sure you always can support that with why is it you believe that. So when someone spouts something at me that I'm not quite sure I agree with, rather than feeling like, oh, I don't agree with that, I'm going to have a conflict here, what I'm more interested in is not the opinion they have, but how did you arrive at that exactly? And that's a worthwhile debate that we need to do with ourselves. How is it you've arrived at this conclusion about life or whatever it is that you want to speak about, how did you arrive at that exactly? What life experiences? And make sure they're personal experiences. The Think Off highly recommends that this essay be loaded with not, well, I heard once a philosophy that said that cooperation is better than competition. No, they want you to have your own reasons based on your own life. And I loaded my essay and my subsequent arguments with experiences from my own life. Is that not all that each of us has to share? All I can give you from my opinion is my perspective based on my life, my experiences. Plus, <laughs> later on, that's what becomes engaging. That's what people want to hear. People don't want to hear a book report from the latest research you read. They want to understand how you arrived at the belief you arrived at based on your personal experience. That's what people find compelling. So, I had done my homework, right, which is preparation. I was selected as one of the finalists, and by the way, I chose, what do you think? Cooperation. So here's the irony, guys. I won, an, I won a competition <laughs> arguing that cooperation was the higher value than competition. But I ultimately, while I could, have, I, I could have gone either way, I had a long list of reasons for one, I had a long list of reasons for the other, I ultimately had to look at my own life experiences, what, did I, what have I truly learned in my life, going all the way back to kindergarten. I started in my essay of an experience in kindergarten where because I was not very socially refined, when they would open up the doors in the morning and you had about 10 minutes to play before it got down to business and all the kids made a mad rush to the toy area, I wanted the biggest and the best blocks. If people got in my way, I said things that I guess you're not supposed to say. <laughs> and so on a daily basis in that kindergarten, the teacher would take me to the bathroom, make me take a bite out of a bar of ivory soap and oh, chew it. No. I didn't have to swallow it, but I had to chew it and then spit it out. And I'd go home at the end of the day with tears running down my face and my mouth all raw. Now, my mother did eventually take me out of this kindergarten. But that was a lesson about competition versus cooperation. And I, I started with that idea and traced it through a lot of life experiences that gave me the feeling that for me, cooperation was a higher value than competition. Okay, let's move on to eloquence. I don't really have to say this to Toastmasters, but having confidence in yourself is obviously appealing to the listener. It's appealing to the audience. You're not very effective when you're meek and you're timid and you don't believe in what you're saying. 
Now, you can actually have too much confidence or appear that you have too much confidence. And that's actually something that, unless you get some feedback that tells you that, you wouldn't probably know otherwise that you might actually come off as being a little too confident. But that's obviously a skill that we never should ignore is being confident. And as the quote there says, if you fill in the blank, confidence is preparation. Everything else is beyond your control. Confidence is preparation. So I arrive in New York Mills and meet the other three finalists, and I'm intimidated. I don't, I'm thinking, well, I don't belong to these people. How in the world am I going to be able to compete with these people? They're brilliant. They're articulate. One of them had been a finalist before. I mean, I'm thinking, I just don't belong, right? Well, they chose my essay for a reason, right? But that, I was kind of feeling a little less than confident as I actually got into the debate process. So, getting feedback will help with your eloquence. I made it through the first round, right? I won the first round. I was chosen as the, the one that made the case for cooperation, however they decided, better than the other woman that I was competing against. And so I go down into the audience. This is before it was announced that I had won. So they take a break, and the audience votes are all being tabulated. And I go down into the audience because my mother and my sister had come in from Wisconsin to be there to cheer me on. And I ask my sister during the break, you know, how did I do, right? I want some feedback. My sister tells me, this was a really hard choice. I wasn't sure who to vote for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your feedback. <laughs> Now, my sister just has a way of saying things like that, you know, that's just one of her character traits that, you know, she just says things probably didn't really mean to hurt my feelings, but I was feeling a little bruised at that moment, like, wow, my own sister isn't sure. But fortunately, when they called us back up on stage, they did announce, Blaine, you're moving on to the next round. That was great, but feedback is the rocket fuel that propels your eloquence, right? And we practice this a lot in Toastmasters, but you just can't get enough. All right, next point, unique and valuable. To be eloquent, not only is the stuff that's coming out of your mouth need to have a value, but it should be unique because that's what people pay for. So if anybody's interested in not just speaking for free, but speaking for a fee, it's that combination of providing unique and valuable insights that what, that's what people are drawn to. That's what people will pay you for, unique and valuable insights. And what you speak about should just be the tip of the iceberg. You know, we craft these presentations in Toastmasters as if, you know, seven minutes is kind of like, this is the best, this is all I've got on this particular topic. But anytime you're engaging in something outside of a Toastmasters presentation, what you say should just be the little itty bit of what you could say. So there's a whole iceberg below that you can draw from when there's questions, when there's challenges. So I went to this competition. I tend to over-prepare. I went to this competition with 50 talking points. Shortly before I arrived, they released the essays of all the finalists. So I was able to read the other competitors' essays, see what their points of view were, figure out what I agree, disagree with, what was weak in their arguments. And I had 50 talking points so that when I'm up on this stage doing something I've never done before, I've been professionally speaking since 1999. I've been in front of plenty of groups, but I've never been up on a stage in a debate format with these bright lights in my face. I can't see anybody out there. I'm a trainer by nature. I like to see the people. I like to try to connect with people. I wanted my talking points. Now, how many of those 50 talking points do you think I actually used? Five, three, three. Two. <laughs> now, part of that was because I wasn't understanding the questions. Seriously, this moderator that was asking the questions, I didn't know what language they were speaking. <laughs> and, and it was partly because of my discomfort in that first round, and it was partly because this was very intellectual. Well, I can, I can, I guess, try to match people intellectually once in a while, but I'm a big believer in simplicity, third grade language, bring it down to a level we can all understand, and they're throwing out these lofty questions where I'm just thinking, I hope the other person has to answer this one first. Because maybe in their answer, I'll figure out what the question is. Right? And it was just like a presidential style debate. So there's this moderator that throws out the question to one person, and it's a timed response, and then the other person can, you know, 
don't have a say as well, that's time. Then they get their question first. And then finally, at the end of the round, you make a closing statement. And that's the end of the round, and the audience votes who did they think did the best. So the tip of the iceberg. And being brief and concise, I have a theory about a half a dozen. There's only about a half a dozen things you need to know about anything. The big things, right? What do you look for in a soulmate? About a half a dozen things probably are kind of the big things, right? You're going to buy a new car. What are your considerations when you buy a new car? About a half a dozen things probably. You start to build a list any longer than that, you're losing your audience. You're getting lost in your own trains of thought. So brief and concise. So in my closing statement for round one, I actually had written it ahead of time. I was an optimist. I figured, I don't want the closing statement, the last words I give the audience before they vote, to be this rambling, well, I, this last few minutes was really interesting. I wanted it to be carefully crafted. These are my serious beliefs on this topic. I am leaving you with these thoughts before you vote. Clear and concise. So I drew in the Declaration of Independence and Benjamin Franklin's quote that you see in the handout. Talk about a, a period of cooperation, creating the Declaration of Independence. And then I invoked, at the end of my closing argument, 9-11. <coughs> and how the whole world came together as a common humanity as a result of 9-11. Again, the spirit of cooperation, not competition, and how powerful that was. I wanted those final things that I said to leave something in the minds of the audience members who were going to be deciding blame or the other person. So, again, I made it through the first round. I had been expressive enough. <coughs> Would it be enough to get me through round two? Let's go to engagement. In round two, I'm matched up with this incredibly, well, let's just say he's a character. The son of Italian immigrants. A professor of English composition from the University of Minnesota. Here's non-college going Blaine Rada standing there. And this guy's a character. I mean, he's got the audience in the palm of his hand. He's the one that thought it was a trip to New York. <laughs> he had it prepared. He, was, he could do this stuff extemporaneously off the top of his head. So here's Blaine with his hours of preparation and his 50 talking points. And here's Angelo Volpe just winging it and having a great time. And the audience is just laughing and having a good time. I'm thinking, OK, I've got to step this up a notch. Now, I survived the first round, which was incredibly uncomfortable, remember? So I decided the only way I'm going to get through this thing is to let's start having fun, shall we? Right? This is not the end of the world up here. This should be fun. What do I do for a living? I'm up in front of people all the time. But what I do differently as a livelihood that wasn't happening here was I engage people. So I started engaging people. I pretended I could see them. And I started treating this as if it was a big training event. And we're all here and we're going to have a good time. And I actually got people involved physically and had them do something with their bodies that reinforced a point that I was making, engagement. Now, a few more points. Take a breath. I haven't done much of that in this presentation, and I told you I wouldn't because I'm trying to give you as much content in our time frame as I can. But we need to stop and just let people take in what you've just given them. Plus, it's a great opportunity for you to collect your next thought. And here's a technique for those of you that are worried about, well, if I stop, then I have to go back and I need to read something. See, stop, say. Here's a technique for you. See, stop, say. If you're going to stop and speaking about what you're speaking about, because you need to refer to some notes or a handout, or as I've been doing throughout the presentation, you see what it is that you're going to say next, then you stop, and then you say it. You won't be reading from your material, which does kind of disengage the audience. And I was up here the whole time scanning my notes and talking to them like this. And a lot of people are checking out because I'm not looking at you anymore. So take a look at what it is you want to say. Stop. And then go ahead and say it. Now you know it. Now it's front and center in your mind. Just a little technique that might help. Asking questions. Now the implication here with asking questions is that you listen. And a lot of times when we ask questions as a presenter, we're really only kind of half listening, aren't we? I mean, sometimes I couldn't repeat back what a person said to a question because I really wasn't focused on them. I'm still focused on me. 
So I'm trying to be nice and ask questions, but in reality, I'm still nervous or anxious or worried about my time or the content. Stop. Listen. That engages people. Tell your stories. I've said that a couple of times. Now, I invoked some history to help me build my stories. So you'll see a quote on here from Adolf Hitler that basically said cooperation is bunk. Right? Nothing ever significant has been achieved by coalitions. I used that quote in my essay, and then I went on to say, I've been to the north coast of France a couple of times, and I've stood there at the cliff looking out over Omaha Beach where the D-Day invasion took place, and I can tell you it was a coalition, it was cooperation that achieved something great that day. Hitler was wrong. So I'm using my own experience, my own feeling, having been at the grave sites of all of those Americans that died there, or those that wished to be buried there. The family said, yeah, you can bury them there, you don't have to bring them home, which is, the cemetery is amazing. If you ever have the opportunity to be there, it's to, it takes your breath away. Yeah. So I used that experience, it's my experience, but I also tied it to what I believe to be a complete you know, misinterpretation or, or mistruth from Adolf Hitler. Tied in history, somebody else's thoughts, but wrapped it around my own experience. That engages people. And at the very end of my essay, I tied the whole ivory soap story that I started my essay with, and at the very end had this following quote, that I use ivory still to this day, and I do. You'd think I would be really scared of it, right? But no, I mean, I use ivory soap to this day. And its sweet smell reminds me that cooperation benefits society more than the bitter taste of competition. My stories. That's what people are affected by. That kind of leads me to the next blank there, amplified authenticity. If you can take you and charge it up, build it into your presentations. That's what people want. Now, a lot of times we don't think that. You may not have enough confidence in yourself. You may not think your life is that interesting. I beg to differ. Take an inventory of your experiences. Nobody's lived the life that you've lived. You have things to share. Amplify that in your speaking. Not, it's all about me, look at me, I'm so great, look what I've done. But your stories, your examples, your life experiences, people want to hear that. Now, my wife always says things like, well, my life isn't very interesting. Who want to hear anything about me? And sometimes we feel that way. That's, that's a voice that's not truth. Okay, influence and persuasion. If you are in a situation where you need to influence and persuade, my suggestion to you is emotion. This is a hard one for me. I'm not an emotive person. And I'm not talking about, you know, let's all cry and Let's scream, and that, if that's your style, then I guess that's what you do. But I'm just saying, bring emotion into what you're saying. That is persuasive. That makes an impact. So in my final closing argument, I brought in a quote from JFK's inaugural address that supported cooperation. And I tied cooperation to the word love. I kind of made it appear as if they were the same. And so I said, if the debate is over loving or not loving, it's no contest. Love wins. Angelo Volpe said later, as soon as I said that, it's over. Because who's going to argue love? Who's going to go, eh, love's not important? <laughs> now, had I not crafted that ahead of time and had that in my closing argument, I can assure you, I would not have just come up with that spontaneously while I was standing up on stage. But that was an emotional moment. And if you're really thinking about others, which is what this whole thing of engagement is about, it's, it's not me up here. And I hope you're even sensing that a little bit today. As much as I'm trying to be the presenter, I hope that what you're sensing is that this is not me, about me. It's really about what value can I bring to you I love the quote at the bottom of the page about before speaking, especially that part about does it improve on the silence. 
That is so much about your audience, your coworker, your spouse, your child, whoever it is that you're having this conversation with. If you can literally think to yourself, now wait a minute before I say anything, is this actually an improvement on the silence? You will be very calculated in what you say. And I don't mean calculated as in I'm trying to use words or phrases to manipulate. I mean I'm being very intentional. And that kind of gets back to being confident in yourself, pausing and stopping, collecting your thoughts. You know, somebody asks you a question, you can have a fire response back immediately. Sit with that question for a few moments. What do I really think about that? And then go ahead and say what you think. But does it improve upon the silence? That's a challenge. Okay, some bonus tips. How are we doing on time? Where's my time? We're all right? How much time? Yeah, 33 minutes. You're at 33 minutes, you have to I'm a little, okay, good. Well, I'm also trying to build us a little time back in our agenda since we're a little behind. Okay, some bonus suggestions for you. Congruency. I talk a lot about this with people. That it's really important that you are consistent in who you are no matter what the context. So if a speaker that you admire is one way on the platform and then you see them off stage another way, you completely lose respect for that person which may or may not be fair, but it's like the person coming out of church that's cursing at their kids, you know? I mean, it, there's something about that that's not congruent. So check out this video on, on YouTube. Just do a search, First Bank Hotel. It's a couple of minutes. You'll know exactly what it's talking about, and it, it definitely applies to us as speakers and congruency. Next, depart from convention to gain attention. Don't be what everybody else is. Don't be what you think you're supposed to be. Be you, be different, be unique, be outrageous if that's what you are. Be precise and unemotional if that's what you are. But so many times I think we get wrapped up in this idea that to be effective communicators, you know, we have to be all these things and Toastmasters gives us an opportunity to kind of practice being things that we're not necessarily used to being when we make presentations. But really, ultimately, you are who you are, and that's what you bring to the party, and you're the best you that there is. So I don't worry about convention. Don't worry. You know, we have a lot of that in Toastmasters, right? Protocol, the way things are supposed to be done. That's fine within Toastmasters. But outside of Toastmasters, that stuff is not that important. Just picked a great quote about Martin Luther King. You know, again, I don't really have to tell this group, but you've got things inside of you that matter deeply. And if, if those are not expressed, you know, it, it, it's an idea that's, that's still born. I mean, it, it, I can't encourage people enough this year's think off is over, right? So what happens is in January, they announce the question. You have all the way until April 1st to submit an essay. By May 1st, they pick the finalists. By the second weekend in June, I think they have the debate. It's all done for that year. So they've already picked their finalists for Does Poetry Matter? They'll debate in a few weeks up in New York Mills, Minnesota. But you know what I'll be doing one of the first few days of January of 2012? I'm going to www.thinkoff.org. I'm going to look to see what the question is. And if it's a question that I have an opinion about, I'm going to start collecting my thoughts. And I'm eventually going to submit an essay. And I don't care if they pick it or not. It doesn't matter. The process of going through refining your ideas about an important question and crafting it into only 750 words it makes me, I think, a much more effective communicator in every respect. So I would encourage you all to do that. And back to this idea about paradigms. Again, I, I think that this quote from a gentleman that I just met several months ago, these are his words. Becoming fluent in the other person's paradigm 
right? That's being able to see and argue the other side, not just yours. And when worldviews clash, how can we be certain we aren't the ones that are wrong? Interesting idea. So I titled this, Think Before You Speak. Even though I really talk a lot about speaking, presenting, because that's what you want to hear. But I recently came across an advertisement of all things. I don't even usually pay attention to advertisements. Television advertisements, I don't even know what's going on. I could be staring at the television, I have no idea what's happening. I tune out. Radio advertisements don't really pay much attention. Print advertisements and magazines, I go right by them. But here's right, you know, think. Well, I'm America's greatest thinker. What do they have to say about thinking, right? <laughs> this is a, an organization in Cotter. Right? You're familiar with Cotter. Half Qatar, is that how I say it? Halfway around the world. I just want to read, this is an, an ad for an organization that is in, involved in education and empowering people's lives in that part of the world. Interesting work. But they say, think. Few things possess more power than a thought. Because a thought has the potential to become something significant. To solve something meaningful. And to inspire us to achieve great things. What's, what makes a thought so powerful is that it can be created by anybody, at any time, from anywhere. That's why thinking should be encouraged and nurtured in all its forms. No matter how small or how impossibly grand. Remember? Why? 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 Right? Let's not squash that. Because wherever thinking happens, big ideas follow, minds become enlightened, knowledge grows, and people discover new ways to unlock their potential. So start thinking. I hope I've given you some things to think about. If anybody did not get a handout, if we did run out and you'd like one, just let me know. Or if anybody's got extras, wave them around. Um, I have put up here on the platform some of my business cards. If you want any of my contact information, help yourself. Thank you guys very, very much. <laughs>